Good evening and welcome to the, to the Bermuda Government's Roundtable Discussion on Bermuda's Economic Development Strategy. My, my name is Shivani Sait, I'm a local entrepreneur and business owner and I'm very honoured to be the moderator for this very important discussion this evening. The Bermuda Economic Development Strategy, which builds on the work of the 2021 Economic Recovery Plan, was launched on June of this year. The newly formed advisory board that collaborated with the Ministry of Economy and Labour to produce the strategy consisted of representatives that I'm delighted to welcome as our esteemed panellists this evening. So if I may present to you, starting from my left, Joshe Adams, JPMP, Chairman, Bermuda Economic Development Corporation. Good evening and welcome. Malika Cartwright, the Director and from the Department of Workforce Development. Good evening. Very warm welcome. And on my right, I have David Hart, the CEO of the Bermuda Business Development Agency. Welcome, Delighted David. Delighted to be with you. Thank you. And of much. course, our infamous and honourable Minister Haywood. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> so let's begin. Oh, it's going to be a fun event, I hope. Everyone's going to start smiling at me soon. Um, I would like to begin by asking each of you to please tell me about your organisation, its mission, its purpose and your role within it, please. So I may begin actually with Honourable Minister Hay Hay Haywood. Yeah. So as the Minister of Economy and Labour, ultimately I'm responsible for economic growth, economic development and the expansion of jobs within the economy. The way in which I like to categorise the Ministry is that the Ministry of Economy and Labour is one that's focused on the future, we're focused on change and we're focused on people. Thank you very much. David, I'll come to you next. Well, okay. Well, I'm the CEO of the Bermuda Business Development Agency, and the BDA is a public-private partnership with a mission to grow and diversify Bermuda's economy. Uh, we're a small not-for-profit, uh, just 11 staff, uh, but a staff who loves Bermuda and um, I think just does an amazing job punching above our weight every day, much like Bermuda does. Okay. Uh, we try to attract foreign direct investment and in so doing, grow the economy and create jobs. Thank you. Look forward to hearing more about that a little bit shortly, I should say, not too much later. Okay, Malika, I'll come to you next. Please tell us about yourself. Uh, at the Department of Workforce Development, I am pleased to lead a staff of 18, so not too many more than David has. <laughs> and our mission is to ensure that we are creating a sustainable workforce for Bermuda. And we do that by supporting persons who find themselves to be unemployed, underemployed, but also those persons who would like to change careers okay. and uh, find themselves wanting to uh, explore a different career option. And we are the keepers of most of the information on what those careers could be, but also, most importantly, helping you to figure out what it is that you'd like to do and us supporting you on your journey to get there. Thank you. Likewise, I look forward to hearing more about that, as I'm sure our audience will as well. So, Joshe, coming to you now, finally. All right, finally. <laughs> um, Joshe Adams, I'm the, as, you said, as you mentioned earlier, I'm the chair of the BEDC. Um, the BEDC, effectively, as I see it, is responsible for has two main focuses. The first is business development for our entrepreneurs. So individuals who come and have an idea. And so the focus is how do we take it from an idea and let it manifest and become a full operating business? And how do we coach them along that process? And then there's the second pillar where we're focused on economic development. So how do we create an environment so that more businesses can thrive in Bermuda? Okay, thank you very much. So we're here to discuss the economic development strategy, learn more about it and help hopefully understand more. So it's a succinct 63 page document. I can imagine a lot of work and time has gone into that. It's a phenomenal document. Questions have been submitted to the ministry and I'll be asking each of you to, for your comments. So I'm going to kick this off with, I hope it's a relatively easy one. What was the catalyst that led to the creation of the Bermuda Economic Development Strategy? So, sometime last year, around September, we released a report which was titled The Challenges of an Aging Population. And we recognized that we had a demographic challenge in Bermuda. Our birth rate is declining, our population is aging, and our population is aging in a rapid pace. Um, this is going to cause a number of workforce challenges and also economic challenges for Bermuda in terms of us having a sustainable economy moving forward. And so 
the paper looked at it from a lens of what is the portion of the working population required to support our aging population. And when we looked at our early age dependency ratio, in 2017, our early age dependency ratio was lower than the OECD average. In 2026, it's projected to be well above. It means that Bermuda is aging more rapidly than most developed countries. As a result of that, we recognize that we are going to have a workforce shortage if we do nothing. And so the economic development strategy was designed to create robust economic activity across multiple industrial sections within Bermuda that actually creates jobs and that are created can fill with able by communities as well as a district level to increase our working population battle support aging. Okay, thank you very much for succinct and clear. How would you currently describe the Bermuda economy and workforce? And I suppose, unfortunately, Minister <laughs> Haywood, that's coming back to you again. We'll let everyone else sit comfortably for now. Well, the data reflects that Bermuda's economy is extremely resilient and robust. And so we've had um, economic growth in 2022. Um, the most recent economic data for 2023 indicates that Bermuda's economy continues to expand. Um, if we look at our current or most recent job numbers, we see that we have not just an expanding economy, but we are increasing the amount of jobs in the economy the amount of Bermudians working within the economy has increased. Unemployment's down, Bermudian unemployment's down, youth unemployment's down. So those are all positive signs. Yes. Um, we continue to monitor the data and they continue to trend in the right direction. Whether you're looking at our tourism numbers, whether you're looking at wholesale consumption, whether you're looking at our payroll tax data, um, it continually reflects economy that is um, robust and continue to grow. Thank you. I certainly look forward to hearing more about Bermuda thriving because that is our common goal. Mm -hmm. So what is the actual aim of the strategy and what are the strategic priorities if I think we're all pretty versed with with the 63 page document for, for those listening in? P could you please tell me a little bit about that? So the economic development strategy is specifically um, designed so that we can have diverse um, economic growth and development within our economy. In order to achieve that, we needed um, not just the public sector, but the private sector all working together to achieve a set of common goals that would allow us to achieve those particular aims. And so the economic development strategy is set out in five strategic priority areas. Number one is local business exp expansion and retention. Number two is marketing and attraction of foreign direct investment. Number three is ensuring that we support entrepreneurship and small business development. Number four is continued execution of the economic recovery plan. The economic recovery plan was a plan that we put in place to kickstart the economy after the economic downturn caused by the pandemic. And number five, which I think is the most important, is people. Ensuring that we develop a workforce that is able to take advantage of the current and future jobs. But then also um, ensuring that we develop Bermudians to their fullest capabilities, but also close the skills gap where it exists with expatriate labor as well. And then determining how we can better utilize immigration to unlock for other economic activity. Okay, thank you. And I know through the course of this evening, having looked at the questions, we'll be talking more about that as well. So the last, well, maybe not the last question for you, Minister <laughs> Hayward, but another one for you, I'm afraid. Who is responsible for the implementation of the strategy? And how will its progress actually be monitored? I think those are key points to bring out before we delve into the detail. So the uh, Ministry of Economy and Labor drew the strategic part of 
be development of be developing key um, performance and the, the resources allocated to that the indicators uh, how do we know if our strategy is working we're going to know it if our strategy is working then we look at the economic data and it continues to trend in the right direction then we look at the job recovery when we see more diversification of our um, economy okay thank you very much so looking at the new economic development strategy, the three largest sectors representing 56% of Bermuda's economy are international business, real estate, and financial and insurance. The top contributor to the economy is international business activity. So with a five-year growth average of 2.4%, could I ask what to any of my panelists now, I'll open it up, what are your expectations for the next five years? Is there a particular sector that you feel will experience heightened growth? How does it all look in your minds? Okay, I'll start. I'll be happy to start. Yes, thank I'm you, David, sure. sure. <laughs> we at the BDA spend a, a, a great deal of our time, energy, and effort in the international business yes. uh, realm and sector, and I'm quite familiar with it as we go around the world to promote Bermuda and try to encourage companies to come back and invest in Bermuda, launch company here, create jobs here. Um, it's been so impressive for me over now 12 years to get to know the strengths that Bermuda has in the international business sector. To be clear, I've only been in the role a little over two, but I've been okay. coming to Bermuda for about a dozen years and uh, first got um, you know, very well versed in the reinsurance sector that was here and the strengths that exist in Bermuda as the risk capital of the world. And I think um, we've seen year-over-year year growth in that sector again this year yes. uh, with new formations, new capital. And I, I suspect if we continue to do the right things, we'll continue to see uh, that really, really solid uh, foundation in the risk sector continue to grow for Bermuda. We're, we're one of the most exceptional places on the planet when it comes to uh, the risk sector. And, and by the way, that's across a whole variety of subsectors, which okay. we can get into. Uh, two other areas I might mention that we're keenly focused on at the BDA and I see as ripe opportunities. Um, one is in climate risk solutions. We mm -hmm. launched that initiative a little over two years ago. Um, and perhaps we can get into some of the details we about that shortly. later. But I do think that's a ripe area for okay. Bermuda that a lot of us are working together on and leaning into. And the other is technology. The world's changing just so fast, right? Every day we yes. see a new technology that we realize can reshape the way we live our lives. And so we just had a technology summit uh, that we hold every year here in Bermuda. And the one thing I'm confident in is change will only speed up. It's the one constant in our lives now is that change <laughs> will keep happening and it'll just get faster and faster. And so the quicker that we can um, you know, build fit for purpose legislation and regulatory climates that can attract new breakthrough areas in technology I think those are big opportunities. No, thank you. I thank you for your vision because in your particular role, it's a very unique role where you can actually, you're the visionary. You're seeing what's happening outside. You're selling Bermuda to outsiders. You're coming back. You're seeing what's happening on the inside. So thank you for your vision. So, Ronnie, if I can add to yes, please. Um, what David articulated. International business is fundamentally important to Bermuda's future. Right now, it represents roughly around 28% of all economic activity in Bermuda. And as David said, it's diverse. But we are viewed as the world's risk capital. We are a leader in insurance-linked securities. Um, we invented captive insurance. And as I talk to potential businesses that seek to domicile here, um, it is Bermuda's overall value proposition that they appreciate. And so I do not see that sector abating anytime soon. Um, we anticipate seeing continual growth for my international business sector. The other two um, sectors that you mentioned, which were real estate activities yes. and financial and insurance services, we anticipate growing as well. We recognize now that our real estate sector is almost at capacity which yes. means that we can only um, move upwards from the position that we're currently in. 
and we'll talk later as, as it pertains to housing and how we want to see um, greater levels of development in that particular space. But that sector remains strong and uh, local finance and insurance sectors remain strong as well. You will see our banking profits, which are released on a quarterly basis, which are positive, and you will see the profits coming from our local insurance companies, um, which are profit profitable on a quarterly basis and doing extremely well. And so I don't see that those three sectors are baiting anytime soon, and the data that we are looking at reflect continual growth in those particular sectors. So yeah. I'm uh, taking from that we, we need to continue to support these sectors enormously and make sure we we continue in their growth? Correct. As we looked at the economic development strat strategy in strategic priority one, when we talk about local business retention and expansion, we're talking about retention of businesses that are currently here and helping them expand as much as they possibly can so that they can drive in this business ecosystem. Um, so it is extremely important that the industries that are our growth drivers we continue to fuel those industries. Thank you. Jashe, yeah. I'm sorry. No, uh, please. Uh, it's always <laughs> difficult to follow the minister. Um, <laughs> but certainly, um, you know, I totally agree. I mean, to keep it simple, right, there's part of us where we're going to recognize where our bread is buttered. And so we recognize the value that international business play. And one of the unique propositions that we have to continue to foster is the reality that our industry, our legislator, and our regulator are all within walking distance of each other. That is something that you just don't get in, in, in many countries. Absolutely. And that, that is something that uh, we value and will continue to foster. And then uh, it's the constant engagement with industry that allows us to develop and grow the economy as well. But in terms of diversity, it's an interesting space because if there's one thing that the pandemic has taught us is the need for diversity mm. and the impact that should one pillar take a significant hit, the impact that has on the overall economy. So the focus then is, as, as, as a government's perspective, is increasing our air, um, airlift, as well as the focus is on um, getting uh, Southampton Princess back online, focusing on tourism, mm -hmm. but also start to branch out further than that, um, continue to advance in the fintech space, and I hope we get talk can talk about that a bit further. Um, and then I'm hoping, knocking on wood, that we continue to foster and grow our entrepreneurial space as well. Yes, and again, we will be talking we will more talk about, about that. that. We're Looking going to talk to about it. everything here today. <laughs> but there's also this interconnectedness between the business sector and also with the hospitality sector, yes. which is also one of the other pillars of Bermuda's economy. And even though it's taken a hit due to COVID and some other challenges that have happened, that sector has to grow along with the business sector because they rely on each other. Um, a few years ago, there was a talk about um, everybody's business. I think the BDA had that. Um, had a campaign talking about everybody's business and talking about how all of these other sectors actually connect to in the international business sector. So even though you may work in a hotel or you may work um, at a wholesaler, you're still supporting international business because they have meetings, there are people who come in for visiting, yes. but also those who are looking for um, utilization of restaurants and all of the other different areas. So there's a lot of interconnectedness when you start to talk about growing the economy and you talk about the business sector, you also are, have to talk about the hospitality sector and how important it is to make sure that we have enough hotel beds and airlifts when we're coming in and people to actually work in this yes. as well. <laughs> and perhaps just to reiterate that, the interlinking of the economy, I think is what people sometimes don't quite realize how important it is. Mm -hmm. And in order for Bermuda to thrive, we need to work together in that unity to build a better Bermuda and to put our best foot forward. So thank you very much. So I'm going to take the elephant out of the room. We'll have to talk about real estate now. <laughs> so the second largest sector is real estate. And on a more serious note, it is one that needs much attention. Um, the speech, we huge challenge within the band that's any on private and <laughs> okay uh, and the question is simply yes we are willing to work with potential investors 
as it pertains to um, supporting them for investment within the city of Hamilton and especially within um, economic empowerment zones. And those conversations have already um, begun. Okay. We have established an Uptown Development Authority, which is primarily look, look um, primarily focused on connecting potential investors with investment opportunities within our economic empowerment zones. Um, we will be expanding our economic empowerment zones yes. um, soon as well. But I released a statement in the House of Assembly which spoke to the need for both, we need public and private sector solutions. So the, the government will do as much as it possibly can to increase the level of public housing stock um, to add to the inventory. But then we also need private sector development. We're looking at development within economic empowerment zones. We're looking at development in the wider city of Hamilton. Um, we have also done a full assessment of the residential plots throughout the entire island. And we've developed determined that there is significant opportunity for development throughout the um, entire island. Yes. The other thing we're trying to um, encourage is working with banks so that um, mortgage rates can be a more affordable so that um, first-time homeowners can get on the, the housing and property ladder. But those conversations regarding approved residential schemes and encouraging investment, there are ongoing conversations that the government is having with industry. Okay, thank you very much. Would anyone else like to la add anything to that? I'm only going to add, I'm pretty much, I'm trying to avoid repeating what the minister <laughs> okay. said, but no, effectively, um, the Uptown Development Authority is within uh, the BEDC. Um, they have a primary focus on um, promoting develop residential development within our economic empowerment zones. Um, development somehow well combine the two is the value that we're trying to bring forward okay thank you very much so as stated in the strategy I might move to the wholesale and retail sector it's the second largest employment sector in the economy after international business of course it has been a challenging environment for this sector particularly driven by the pandemic we've all seen what Bermuda has gone through locally what strategies, may I ask, are being implemented to protect and grow this sector? And so I can begin from a broad base. We recognize how important it is for the employment um, of Bermudians. Um, there is a large percentage of Bermudians who work in our hotel and retail sector, and it's primarily Bermudian based. And so we want to ensure that that sector um, is preserved. The sector is battling with uh, the world moving to a more global model where e-commerce is more um, prevalent than brick and mortar. Yes. No, and people having access to goods throughout the whole world and getting those goods landed in Bermuda in a timely fashion. And so that is what the strategy is actually, um, that sector is actually battling with. But the focus in terms of where opportunities lie for Bermudians in terms of small business development and entrepreneur lie within that sector. And so when we talk about we're encouraging small business development and we're talking about we're encouraging entrepreneurship outside of the um, service sectors, um, which you will find entrepreneurship and small business development, we are primarily looking at um, the retail sector as a key area in which Bermudians can capitalize on opportunity and provide a set of unique goods that okay. the um, residential base would appreciate. Okay, thank you very much. And, you know, the pandemic, just, just to carry on from what you're saying, actually, the pandemic highlighted our heavy reliance on importing most of our goods, including food. Mm -hmm. um, the economic strategy does address food security as a vital component, component of national security with regards to agriculture, forestry and fishing sectors. So again, I may ask, what strategies have been put in place to support and protect these sectors? 
If you look at the economic development strategy, um, we really want to grow our agricultural and fisheries sector. Right now, our agricultural and fisheries sector represent less than 1% okay. of all economic activity in Bermuda. Um, that's simply not sustainable nor good enough. And so the Ministry of Economy and Labor will be working with the Ministry of Home Affairs to put together an integrated agriculture strategy. And that integrated agriculture strategy would ensure that we reduce the cost of production for our farmers, find ways to better support our farmers, find ways to get their goods to market in a more efficient uh, manner, but then also look at how we can better utilize technology to increase our local agricultural production and how we can actually reduce the level of imports that um, we require on an annual basis and increase local domestic production. And so we're working with agronomists and we're working with um, economists and also our local farming community mm -hmm. to determine what their needs are and then put strategies in place so that we can expand our um, agricultural sector. And then when we talk about fisheries, um, that will be integrated in our entire um, Blue Ocean Prosperity Plan. Yes, which we're going to talk about. And again, increasing employment all around because we're creating new jobs through these strategies, which mm -hmm. is very key. So I think, David, I've given you quite the rest here. You have. <laughs> <laughs> so if we could come on to climate risk finance. Sure. Um, as you mentioned earlier, incredibly important to us, incredibly important to the island. So what is the BDA doing to position Bermuda as the climate risk finance capital of the world? Got that out in one breath. <laughs> thanks for uh, thanks for the opportunity to jump back in. We um, we launched the Bermuda Climate Initiative a little over two years ago now, and our board of directors and our partners in government and, and many others had this had this strong view that Bermuda was ex positioned exactly right to be a leader in climate risk solutions, just as we had been in so many other areas of risk solutions over the last. 60 years. And so uh, when I came on board, we started taking uh, the message back out on the road to the financial centers around the globe, including several trips to New York City, <clears throat> several to London, as well as Singapore and others, uh, San Francisco. And it was to, to start to tell the story that Bermuda had the right attributes and the right strengths um, to be a global leader in climate risk, just as we had in other areas. We met with asset allocators. We met with leaders in um, uh, the scientific community and in the climate space. We met with technology entrepreneurs and renewable energy entrepreneurs. And the reception, I have to say, was quite good uh, in those financial centers. And then so two years ago, uh, Deputy Premier Roban was about to take a trip to represent Bermuda at COP26 for those who haven't heard of COP, it's sort of like the global climate yes. summit that's held once a mm -hmm. year. And BDA was thankfully tapped to assist with that trip. And so we went there and carried the message to COP to a, literally to an international audience. And we did that again last year at COP 27 in Egypt. And so what we've done is we've built out these contacts around the globe that are interested in these issues and are trying to come up with ways to um, offset climate challenges we're facing globally. Um, we don't know what all of that's going to look like, but we, know as, but we do know as countries and as companies are trying to meet their own climate goals, they're searching for solutions. And Bermuda can be a solutions hub in that space. So what we've really been doing is, you know, casting our image that we can help with this um, and then trying to create an environment where we can invite them to be here and we've done that by hosting now two climate summits on island, yes. um, billed as the Bermuda Climate Summit. And those brought together thought leaders in that space from around the globe. And typically once they're here, the light bulb, the light bulb goes off and they realize, wow, Bermuda's a sophisticated financial center. It's the risk capital of the world. They probably can help with some of this. Right. I will share one last thing on climate because it just happened this past week. There's um, a client we've worked with for 
gosh, probably nine months now, who had the vision that they wanted to launch a new um, fund whose only purpose would be to invest in new technologies that could be scaled and help the world reach net zero sooner. Okay. And the client was looking at, as I've shared uh, with the minister, the client was looking at four or five jurisdictions, and we succeeded and sold them on Bermuda. And they needed two licenses through the BMA to get that done. They got their second license approved this past mm -hmm. week. And so that's a result of this climate risk initiative, and it's going to you know, stand up right here. No, I think that's a very exciting opportunity for Bermuda. Yeah. And constantly raising the awareness of Bermuda in the world because there are still some people that don't know where we are. Yes. Right. <laughs> um, well, now that I have your ear, David, I shall keep it for a little while. Okay. Um, so following on from the throne speech again for, from a few weeks ago, we heard that the BDA is transitioning to become an IP, an investment promotion agency. So I'm not sure if I should call you BDA anymore. Should I call you IPA? But, mm -hmm. but what, you know, what does it mean exactly? Could you sure. tell us about the IPA? Sure, I'd love to. So um, uh, an IPA is an investment promotion agency. If you looked at sort of the definition or what are the normal things that an IPA does, um, they market and promote an image. Um, they seek foreign direct investment, so investment uh, attraction, investment facilitation. Some of them around the world also have an advocacy or like a public policy uh, development role. And the truth is the BDA does all those things. Right. So one could make a case that perhaps we're already an IPA. And so I want to drill down on what is this, um, this journey we're about to embark on at the BDA. What we really want to do is we want to investigate what are others doing in other countries with their economic development agency, with their IPA. Right. What does a best in class organization look like? How are they funded? How are they staffed? What kind of skills do they have? Um, how do they organize themselves? How do they choose the markets they want to go after, the sectors they go after? Um, we want to become that best in class okay. IPA. And the reason is simple. The world's not standing still, which means our opponents aren't standing still, and we can't either. And so we're going to try to take our game to the next level. Okay. And hopefully what will come out of this is a BDA that's even stronger, faster, better to serve the people of Bermuda than it, than it is today. Okay, so, so it's not quite a name change. We'll still keep BDA plus IPA? Or? Uh, it, it's hard to answer that <laughs> quite yet. We, okay. we are about to embark on the journey. We're, we're interviewing uh, consultancy firms that are world class at this, and we'll probably make that decision this week on which okay. one we're going with. And then we'll be in a, you know, a period of 60, 90 days where right. we're gleaning a lot of information from them from what's going on around the globe, and they'll make a series of recommendations to us and our board. And um, well, It sounds stronger it, it, and better, it, it, which is what we all want, really. Stronger, better, uh, world class. I'm hopeful for all of those things, and I know okay. together we can do it. Mr. Rani, I think what's key is that Bermuda is not resting on our laurels. We recognize that there is untapped up opportunity throughout the world, and we're going to increase, try to increase our market share as best as we possibly can. Like you mentioned, as I travel throughout the world, there are still um, investors and businesses that don't know about Bermuda's value proposition. Yes. And it's about us going out there being deliberate, sharing our value proposition, and attracting um, that investment onto our island. And I think. The key is getting people hurt. Once we get people hurt, they see the level of sophistication. They see um, the um, high quality of life. When they get into the business side of things and they see that we, they can get regulatory clarity, they see that they can get legal clarity, they see the level of professional services um, that they can receive in Bermuda, and then they look and see that we have um, human resources capital that they require. Um, most times we're able to close the deal. It's a no-brainer in my mind. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> okay, so just really to make sure that everybody has understood this better, in the economic development strategy, the current um, purpose of the BDA is to promote and protect sustainable and equitable economic growth and prosperity in Bermuda. From what you've said, this certainly doesn't change. This actually just gets expanded and improved. So, you know, 
should we be expecting any tangible differences or, or is it I, I, not could, only status quo but even better? The goal is to get better every day, okay. right? And um, I think what you, what you will likely see is you'll see us with even more focus than now going after that foreign direct investment dollar. Okay. If that's somewhere on the globe and it's available, we want to be in front of that investor telling the Bermuda story and convincing them that here is where they need to invest that dollar. Okay, and, and are you able to share any of anything that's on the horizon for 2024 with us? I can. I, I'm, I'm really <laughs> glad you asked that because okay. um, oh, we just, we'll we, no, no, we, we just announced this past week the dates for our Bermuda Risk Summit in okay. celebration of being the risk capital of the world. So March 13th through the 15th will be the third annual Bermuda Risk Summit. Okay. And uh, the Association of Bermuda Insurers and Reinsurers and EY came back as lead sponsors for the third year in a row. So we're off and running. We're, we're going to develop amazing content. It's three half days of content. Um, and by design, it's meant to attract people in that sector back to the island to do business with our insurers and reinsurers ahead of the June 1 renewal. So it's perfectly and intentionally placed but, on the yes. calendar in March. And it's been a very successful first two years. And I, I believe our team can make the third one the best one ever. Excellent. And, and to your point earlier, Malika, this is very important for the island. Yes. Definitely. Tourism, taxis, it brings it all home to us, retail. Yes. So we all have a part to play. It's not just that there's a climate summit going on. And none of us need to know about it. It's just that we all can play a part and, and bring more people to the island. Shivani, can I add on that note? Yes. Uh, there, there's two elements to hosting an event like this. And one is that short-term impact that happens immediately with the conference itself. Right. Where we're bringing in people from overseas. Last year's conference had a total of over 450 uh, registered guests. Okay. Over a third of which, maybe approaching 40%, came from overseas. So that short-term impact is good, right? Because it's putting people in Bermuda, uh, filling a hotel room, yes. they need taxi cabs, they need restaurant meals, they might go shopping, all of those good things that help stimulate the local economy. And that's great, but there's also the longer-term impact of all the business deals that get done and all the companies that are involved in those deals, they have to have uh, right. professionals and staff to be able to fulfill the, yes. the deal, right? So it has a short-term impact, but it has this really powerful long-term impact as well. Absolutely. Thank you. And sorry, David, you're still not resting yet. Mm. There has <laughs> been much <laughs> in the news. <laughs> I'm not going to pick on you too much longer. There has been much in the news about Google's announcement that it's going to build a new transatlantic trans submarine cable from the US to Portugal via Bermuda. So, you know, what does this actually mean? What does Shimani, it mean for Bermuda? I, this is one of the most exciting announcements that's happened, you know, certainly in my time in, in the role. And I want to I pay a lot of respect and homage to those who came before me that had the vision that if we pass legislation uh, around subsea cables and make right. it very clear, remove obstacles, remove barriers, make it clear for a company that might want to come in and invest, here's what that can look like and how smooth we can make the process for you. That legislation in 2020 that Bermuda passed had a company like Google look at Bermuda differently and say, you know what, geographically, they've already got all the advantages we're looking for. Right. Now they have the legislative and regulatory environment that fits for purpose what we think we right. can achieve. And so they've announced one new subsea cable called Nuvum, uh, which will run from Portugal through Bermuda to South Carolina. That alone is very exciting, a big investment, because not only will there be uh, marine construction jobs to lay the cable, they're also going to build a data center. And once that's complete, that will be another, I believe it's been reported to be 10 to 20 jobs uh, connected to the data center. But relation long, it's exciting. And eventually, if the relationship continues to go, we have shared that they have a 40 year vision of Bermuda could be in this space and that they might run many, many more cables over time through Bermuda. 
Um, and their phrase has been, and I love this, that we could be the data center, the data hub in the middle of the Atlantic. And okay. so this is a lot of potential investment and it, economic it growth is. for us. Yes. Um, I think, you know, you are also doing a lot of work around the economic and residential certificates as well. So perhaps you can tell me more about those, which perhaps filter into sure. everything that we've already sure. discussed. Well, the BDA does uh, the concierge service for the economic investment residential certificate. Okay. And we do it in great partnership with the ministry. That <laughs> partnership's been terrific. After That's why you're sitting together. Well, I've decided. The, the, the minister <laughs> is great to work with, as is the PS, as is the team at EDD. Okay. But those uh, applications start with us, and we certainly do everything we can to spread the word and market this program. Uh, where individuals who invest $2.5 million in Bermuda through a, a list of seven or eight, you know, a variety of ways, it could be real estate, it could be a new or existing business, but if they choose to do that, um, they can go through this application process uh, and be approved to have uh, residency okay. status. That's excellent. Over the years that it's been in existence, which isn't very, isn't very long, we've had 45 successful applications go through and get the minister's signature. And believe it or not, now, Shivani, that totals just north of $450 million Gosh. in investment. And frankly, I'm so bullish on the ARC program, I think we could market it and make it even bigger. So I keep, okay. I keep urging the minister for a little bit of marketing dollars, <laughs> sir, and we'll make it bigger, I promise. But it is extremely important. It's an initiative um, that we were able to set up in quick order. And industry responded to that and individuals, investors responded to that. And I don't think anybody would have predicted that we have over $440 million of associated investment in the two-year period that that um, program has been run. And it's huge upside opportunity because we haven't been as focused on marketing that certificate as we could be. Right. And so part of um, the economic development strategy is how do we allocate more resources into areas in which we've seen proven success. But the another important point is whether you mentioned the subsea cable or the economic investment certificate, these are economic recovery plan items yes. that are now bearing fruit. And I think that when we set out plans, um, people are looking for initial results um, like overnight success. Yeah. And some of these um, initiatives take time to bear the necessary fruit. And there's huge upside to Google being here and the um, capacity that it would then provide for other large tech companies yes. to utilize their infrastructure so that they can also have a transatlantic hub but then also for companies that want to do business in Bermuda, they now have access to higher uh, high capacity of data at quicker speeds, which means their service offerings can be better for the Bermudian population as well. Absolutely. The potential is immense, and, and really laying that infrastructure is what is key to bearing the fruit. It's never going to happen overnight, mm -hmm. so, so thank you for that. Um, you know, I, I suppose I'm going to let you rest a little now. <laughs> <laughs> I better. <laughs> so just moving on a little bit, it's clear from the legacy of entrepreneurship in Bermuda, we need more small and medium-sized businesses for Bermuda to thrive and grow. So I will open this question out to any panelist. Could you put, please provide an overview of where we stand today? Are we seeing growth? Are you seeing growth? <clears throat> I'll take it first. Thank you. So... It's an interesting and timely question because the BEDC actually is now continuing to build out and improve its business register. Okay. And the reason why we're focusing on building and improving the business register is because it's actually becoming increasingly difficult to actually give a quantifiable answer to that. And what I mean is today someone can literally go to a store, purchase a lawnmower and start a landscaping business and we wouldn't know or go to a wholesale store, buy some baking goods, and start a baking company, and we wouldn't know. And so what we're trying to do is position ourselves to be able to make more and, or better and more informed decisions based off the data. And so we're now focusing on the business register. Okay. So to answer your question, though, the business register currently has about 2,000 uh, businesses on it, 
and we see that number increasingly increasing uh, um, steady. And so absolutely from a perspective of is entrepreneurship growing, I would certainly uh, um, say yes to that. Okay, and thank you. There's also an interest in entrepreneurship. We see at workforce development a lots of young people who come in and say that they want to start their own business. Mm -hmm. They're not quite sure how to do it. So through partnership with BEDC, we actually um, help them to enroll in the courses at BEDC right. and support them through that uh, opportunity that presents itself to them because not everyone wants to work right. for others. Yes. But then we also find out that uh, through the support, they, some of them come back and say, oh, I didn't know it encompassed all of this, yeah. these right. different things that I need yeah. to know in order to be an entrepreneur. Um, so I, I don't, I had a conversation once and they said, you know, it's a lot of people in Bermuda who maybe um, they, they're doing things for extra money, but right. they don't really know all the frameworks that they need in order to have a sustainable business. Mm -hmm. So uh, through BEDC, we can uh, help with supporting them through all the things that they need to know in order to have a successful business. And, uh, and if I can sort of piggyback on sort of that spirit that we're referring to, just to give you a bit of context. The BEDC quite often does annual um, surveys to sort of temperature gauge different stakeholders, different entrepreneurs and the like as to where we are and what we need to do to proceed forward. And what's interesting is um, throughout the years, we have about 70% of the people that we pull say at some point they want to start a business. Right. Mm -hmm. That speaks to um, Bermuda having a real high entrepreneurial spirit amongst us. It's, it's within our culture. And to go even further, what we see is 50% of people who already have a business say that they're already thinking of their next business. Right. And so it's not just is it growing, but it's the fact that we continue to maintain and foster an environment where that spirit is growing and pe we see uh, the fruits from that as well. Shafani, if I can add. Um, last week going was Global Entrepreneurship Week. Yes. And Bermuda celebrated for the um, 16th annual year. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm pleased with the work that the Bermuda Economic Development Corporation has actually done um, over the past 16 years to support Global Entrepreneurship Week, which is celebrated in over 200 countries around the world and touches over 10 million people in the entrepreneurship space yes. worldwide. But what's key is that Persons get on the entrepreneurship journey in different ways. Some people start out as vendors, and they have, um, and you see the expansion of the vendor appetite in Bermuda. Yes. And then what we're trying to do is progress those persons through the entrepreneurship journey and move people from vendors to small business earners, and then from small business earners to medium-sized yes. business earners, and that is the plan, so that um, we can have a cohort that started out as small business earners and move on to being large business owners. Mm -hmm. And so we, we encourage people to, um, you know, really think about small business in a way in terms of it being a stepping stone to greater opportunity as well. And, and just to your point, Minister Haywood, entrepreneurship was never really a thing. As you said, Malika, mm -hmm. most people think they mm -hmm. have to straightaway work for somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I am seeing the change globally. When I'm in the tube in London now, there are actually adverts encouraging you to study about entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. That certainly wasn't a course when I was at university, mm -hmm. but it's great to see that the world globally is recognizing that, so it's, it's a great prospect for us. Mm -hmm. um, what are the new initiatives that, now this is definitely for you, Jesse. All right. I'm, I'm on to you now. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, <laughs> what are the new initiatives that the BDC will be implementing to increase or encourage more clients to start a new business venture? So <clears throat> these are conversations that are ongoing. Um, we can speak to things that are currently in place or the conversation that we're currently having. But, for example, one of the key things is we recognize that, and I think it's the case globally, but the first three years of a business is typically the hardest. Yes. And so how do we best provide incentives, concessions, support for businesses, particularly in those first three years? And so we think of things like um, payroll tax concessions, um, there's also um, talks on um, how do we um, provide support from a social insurance perspective, private, um, private pension perspective. So there are a number of things that um, we are currently doing as well as uh, in the works 
to help yeah. support those businesses, particularly in those first three years. And I think as an entrepreneur, I'd probably also just say that one of the most important things is understanding to manage your cash flow, mm -hmm. just to get you through. Because as somebody once said to me, if you survive two years, then you're going to be OK. <laughs> and Shivani, so. I, I would like to add in, in that space as well, in terms of what we've been able to identify is exactly what MP Adams said, in terms of the support that businesses receive. And that's why we're looking to expand incubator okay. and accelerator yes. programs. Yes. And we have the um, summer employment um, entrepreneurship program for our young people as well, mm -hmm. where we give them seed funding. But we're not just giving persons seed funding, we're helping persons develop the capacity to drive independently. Mm -hmm. um, I had the opportunity to look at a number of workforce development centers, community colleges, and um, incubators in the east coast of the United States. And we recognize that the businesses that were most likely to succeed is the businesses that have the necessary wraparound supports. And that's right. what we're trying to um, provide to our entrepreneurial community. The wraparound support, whether it be them better understanding their cash flow and finances, whether it be them better understanding what laws and regulations govern their um, business, and providing that support on an ongoing basis. The beauty of this is that it's not just the BEDC. You have Ignite, who has an awesome yes. program. Mm -hmm. yes. And so this is where both the public sector and the private sector mm -hmm. are both kicking in, in high gear, to support our entrepreneurs. And the Ignite program, you see the appetite for their programs continuously um, increase, and the appetite for the programs that the BEDC actually run increase as well. And so um, we want to ensure that we have robust a robust system in place to support our entrepreneurs through the entrepreneurial journey. And I, I hope I'm not repeating myself, but what is clearly apparent from this evening is that we really do need to work together to help everybody out. It's not sure. something that you do in isolation. Mm -hmm. Whether you're an entrepreneur, you can still help somebody else, they can Absolutely. help you. And I think that is what is sometimes goes askew in people's minds. They, they think about just about their domain, whereas actually we need to work together as a, on the island. To you thrive, to, you have to create those networks. Yes. So everyone has a network, and then you figure out how to connect what you're doing with what someone else is doing. And then you all start to connect because people think it's a lonely journey to yes. be an entrepreneur, and it, it, it doesn't have to be. Correct. Right. Because you can go to BEDC for a network and go to any of the conferences that they have and create your, your network as well. But you don't have to struggle because someone else already struggled at yes. some point. Right. So that's the reason why you have to keep your network, keep your uh, network open to be able to find out who can assist you with uh, this challenge that you may have because they went right. through. And then you may have figured out a challenge that you can help someone else with. So it's just important for everyone to figure out where those networks are so that everyone can work together so that everyone's successful. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and the island is in essence. Yes. So, you know, that moves us nicely into talking about people. I was going to arrest you, but you're, uh -huh. you're mm -hmm. talking it's now. It's fine. It's <laughs> fine. <laughs> um, for anybody, really, let's talk about people now, which is one of the priorities in the, in the strategy. Um, who would like to start off on this topic? Everyone's yes. smiling. I guess it's you. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so tell us about people. You know, it's, uh, it's incredibly important, as we're discussing here today, we can't thrive without people. No, as hard as technology is going to try, okay. in the end, <laughs> That's also true. you will still need people. <laughs> okay. That's what everyone needs to recognize. And we all need to recognize how can we work with new technology, new businesses, new opportunities. Right. How can you position yourself? How can Bermuda position ourselves to ensure that we have the human capital in order to provide the services that are needed to make all of these things that we've been talking about tonight yes. good. And that's where workforce development comes in, okay. right? Uh, our job is to ensure that we are supporting persons and also giving information. We do a lot of work with individuals who come in and we have assessments and all of that great stuff, but we're also the people who keep information. When persons come in and they say, oh, I'm interested in this, I'm a people person, what kind of job can I get? Right. We're the ones who get to talk to them through it and okay. say, okay, what about working with people do you like? What don't you like? How can we figure out 
what makes their heart sing to say that, yes, you're not just going into this role because someone said, oh, this is where you should be, but also so that when you get up every single day and go to work, it doesn't feel like work. No. I tell people all the time, I don't work a day in my life because I actually really love what I do. Mm -hmm. When you don't like what you're doing and you're only doing it just because, that is a mistake because that's when you call in sick. That's right. when you don't really give your best. Today, um, I was listening, the quote of the day that I was listening to today said, give better service than what you're paid for. Okay. You can only do that if you really love what you do. Yes. So our job is to connect people with the jobs that they love so that they can continue to give better service than what they're paid for. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. I was about to ask, uh, ask you all about the national workforce, but you've done it now for me. <laughs> well, could I just chime in? Because yes, I, I wanted to add something. Oh, sure. An interesting space and sort of a piggyback off what Malika just said is the importance of the introduction of signature schools. Right. And so I'll give you an example. Um, it speaks to our investment in people. So first of all, students pick their passions mm -hmm. and they get mm -hmm. to follow that passion. Uh, there's also a space of, for example, we recognize the importance of and the investment of um, our students in the hospitality industry. And so that's why one of the next signature schools that we open up will focus on hospitality so that we can um, have our students who are passionate about hospitality provide them with a career path in their particular industry. That is investing in the people. Then there's a speaking, um, speaking of the trade industry and, and, and um, insurance and things of that nature. So at an early age, we are able to have our students go through a, a course where that could propel them for the future. In the, no, thank you very much. And, and it's, it's, it's quite interesting listening to the dialogue because the strategy begins with people and it also ends with people. Mm. Um, being a fundamental and critical component to the success of Bermuda. And so when we talk about people, we have to talk about what strategies we're going to put in place to assist people on their continuum um, whether it be connecting them with jobs or progressing them into new careers um, that they actually desire. But helping those individuals reach their fullest potential, and that's part of the work that the Department of Workforce Development is doing. Um, we have a strategy which is specifically focused on um, our youth. We recognize that youth unemployment was high in Bermuda. It was upwards of 30%. Yes. The recent data shows that that has abated a bit and it's just over 10% um, youth unemployment now. That's significant improvement. And we've done a number of things in terms of put graduate training programs in place, expand internships, expand summer employment programs. Um, there are more opportunities for our young people now in Bermuda than ever before. But we need strategies for our young persons. We need strategies for people who have been displaced from the workforce and are looking to retool. We need strategies for persons who um, are in the workforce and feel as though they're underemployed and are looking for upgrades as well. And so this economic development strategy tends to touch on each and every one of those areas. Even for able-bodied persons who are on financial assistance, we talk about how we can um, develop personal employment plans to right. connect those individuals with potential mm -hmm. jobs and ensuring that they have the proper tools that they need to transition. But what MP Adams said is extremely important. When we developed the National Workforce Development um, Plan, we recognized that we needed to ensure that our young people were on our employment continuum, starting from school age. We couldn't continue to wait to persons graduate from Bermuda College or high school for them to begin to get on their career, right. career path and journey. And so part of what we're going to do moving forward and working very closely with Malika and the Workforce Development Board is ensuring that we create career pathways and pipelines. Every school-age person should know what are the key occupational categories in Bermuda, what is the experience required for those categories, what is the education required for those categories, um, what classes they should be studying now, and what are the occupations that are stepping stones that lead to that career. And clearing up some of the misconceptions about 
um, some occupational categories, especially in the areas of skills trades where there's ample opportunity. And that's why we've created the National Certification and Apprenticeship Board, specifically designed to focus on skills trades, national certifications, and expand the level of apprenticeships in Bermuda. Um, and I'm extremely proud of the work that is being done within um, the Department of Workforce Development because it is fundamentally critical that we ensure we maximize our local human resource capacity. And part of that is ensuring as well, when our young people go away to school, they come, come back, back and there is opportunity <laughs> that awaits those individuals. And we attract those individuals back because we can't afford to lose those individuals. Nor we can't afford to continue to allow persons to emigrate to other countries because they believe the grass is green on the other side or because there has been lack of opportunities. So we will look at how we um, mitigate that. And then we have this, this, this next um, set of factors that we had to con consider in terms of continuation of persons' work life. And so persons get to the age of 65, they still want to continue to work, but are being forced out of the workforce at the age of 65, when life expectancy is increasing. And so we'll work on how we can put measures in place to encourage employers to retain persons okay. over the age of 65 as well. Perhaps a little left field, but I'm going to ask anyway. <laughs> so we talk about educating the young from a much younger age than when they're about to leave school, which I think is fantastic. Is there any chance of Bermuda ever having a university? Because part of the problem of the grass being greener <laughs> on the other side is that we have to leave if we want to go to university. Our children have to go overseas. And then, as you said, you know, it can be a, quite a chore to bring them back and encourage them and entice them back. Do you think Bermuda would ever be in a position to offer that sort of level of education? Most certainly. And we always have to think big. There's no reason why um, we don't have a four-year institution. Notwithstanding that, the Bermuda College is creating the appropriate bridges yes. so that a four-year um, degree can be achieved without leaving our shores. And so I'm a recipient of that. So okay. I went to Mount St. Vincent University in association with Bermuda College. And so I done my two years of my business degree in Bermuda College and two years of my um, business degree um, at Mount St. Vincent University on this campus. Right. And okay. so while we may not have a physical four-year university, we are creating bridges where people can obtain the education that they require on island. And Thank you. in addition to that, is that Bermuda College has several articulation agreements with many colleges and universities. So you can start your college career here at Bermuda College, complete two years, and then through an articulation agreement, transfer all of your credits so that you don't have to spend okay. as much and start all over again if you go overseas. Um, they're expanding many of their programs here at Bermuda College as well through certifications. Um, there's some additional um, courses with Monsignor Business, just not, not the business degree anymore. They're expanding into hospitality now. So there is different ways to be able to obtain from being here in Bermuda. And I think we are on the right track for a okay. four-year university year. Yes. I think that maybe um, the start off is to look at some of those um, more popular areas and have a four year in those degree programs first before you expand it to the whole thing. But I think we're in good position to be able to start looking at that. Thank you. Not so left field after all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, Minister Hayward, you covered a lot of my questions there. I'm looking now. Um, Perhaps one again for you, Malika. So how does the personal employment plan address potential barriers to employment? And what role does it play in identifying and addressing the client's needs for skills and career development? This is a great question because <laughs> personal employment plans are um, a journey. And one of the things, um, even when we start to talk about education, we look at those three E's, so it's exposure, which is you want to expose people to careers that are available. You want to give them the education, and then you want to be able to give them the experience. That's how we look at the personal employment plans uh, for those who are coming into workforce development, because we look at what are their interests, we look at if there's any barriers that will prevent them from being able to be successful and how we can um, actually 
transfer them to helping services that they may need, but we are looking at the whole person when they come into workforce development as we develop a personal employment plan. It's not cookie cutter. It's not just someone who comes in and we say, okay, just take these classes. We're really working on meeting people where they are. So people will come in with different levels uh, for their personal employment plan. Okay. So you may have someone who comes in who needs a lot of support and a lot of help and is starting right from the beginning. You may have someone who is transitioning and may not need as much help as the next person. So we're meeting people where they are in this personal employment plans are just that they're very personal to you and it's your own journey as you develop yourself to go back into the workforce or enter the workforce for the first time. All right. A great bespoke experience yeah. actually. Um, so, what, why is, I suppose, no, I'm going to ask something else first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, why is the development of skilled trades considered essential for growth, sustainability, and success of Bermuda's <sighs> economy? And how do skilled trades offer a viable career path for individuals interested in practical fields without <coughs> the college degree? I think that the skilled trades are a lost art in Bermuda okay. for many. Okay. Um, so many people have forgotten that their grandparents, even some of their parents, are skilled tradesmen. It always comes out during a hurricane who knows how to, how to build something, right? <laughs> yes. I have cousins who know how to cut stone and also be able to put the, right. <laughs> put the roof back together after I'll, a hurricane. I'll they, take their number you later. know, they don't. They don't have to. You know, they don't have to worry about it. And I didn't even know they had this skill okay. set because mm -hmm. they, they've kept. They kept keep it under wraps until there's a storm, right? But we need so many different tradespeople in Bermuda. We need plumbers. We need electricians. Yes. Uh, we need welders. Uh, with all of the construction that is going to be happening soon and um, the boom that I know is about to come, the need for people to look at the trades as a viable career option is at a height okay. now. It's so important because I want people to know that just because you're not interested in doing maybe what David does, mm. <laughs> there's, <Sounds fun. laughs> there's still a place for you to be successful and okay. working with your hands. And I think that we as Bermudians need to also um, for lack of a better term, bring the sexy back to okay. the trades <laughs> because it was at a time that people were vying to be in the trades. And then, of course, through the cycle of the world and Bermuda, international business became, you know, that, that new, shiny sexy. and new sexy thing. <laughs> um, and that's where people have gravitated to. But right. we can't forget those people who definitely like to work with their hands, who are artists. Um, you know, there are things when I come and I see what the welders do in order for their... Um, to complete their national certification, I'm amazed at the different things that I've learned in my position about the trades that I didn't know before. It's very exciting. And um, also how technology is going to change what the trades um, look like yes. as well. So it's a very exciting opportunity um, to come into the trades in Bermuda. Okay. Thank you very That's much. It's so funny. If, if I can just add to um, what Malik was saying, as it pertains to misconceptions regarding the trades as well, mm -hmm. Um, we want to change the paradigm um, around this whole thing that um, trades are not well-paying jobs. A lot of individuals are successful um, from professions within the trades. They are well-paying jobs. Trades of the past are not the current set of trades. The utilization of technology in the trade spaces is greater than it's ever been. Um, and so we really want to ensure that our young people are properly informed, and that's some of the work we're doing. Not just going to inform our young people by having trades at our earliest stage of um, their education, so that um, whether they're in their signature schools, but ensuring that their parents are aware of what the experience and education in the trades look like and the outcomes that their child can have by a career in the trades. Um, we also want to ensure that the career counselors are clear on that as well, so okay. they're properly advising the um, young people. But primarily why we're changing the National Training Board to a skills trades certification and apprenticeship board is because we want to see more young persons getting apprenticeship opportunities where they're developing the skill set on the job, and we will be extremely deliberate about that. Okay, thank you. And it's a very key point because 
everybody does have that notion that these jobs are not well paid. Mm -hmm. So that's how we all end up going in different routes. But thank you for clarifying that. And now that you're warmed up again. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we mentioned earlier that, um, you know, as well as our people here in Bermuda, we also need a degree of an expatriate uh, population to help us here in Bermuda to thrive. So as, as well as retaining our current workforce, economic growth can also certainly be achieved through immigration. I, I would have to ask, work permits and policies around it have been notoriously time consuming uh, to process. Could you perhaps provide us with an update of what you're thinking in this space, an update on perhaps the reforms in immigration? Mm -hmm. So one thing that we have to accept is that there will always be, there will always be more jobs in Bermuda than able-bodied Bermudians able to work into those jobs. Okay. So there will always be a need for um, expatriate labor. Right now, Bermudians represent just over 70% of all workers within the country. I know as I walk the street, um, persons always say, it looks like only foreigners are working in Bermuda. Right. Um, that's not the reality. Okay. The reality is the vast majority of our jobs are filled by Bermudians. At, at, a, at a state of 70%, but we recognize that in some areas we do have a mismatch between um, the jobs that are within demand um, and the supply of labor in those occupational categories. And it is our responsibility as a government to facilitate closing that gap as best as we possibly can. Um, we try our best to facilitate the efficient processes of uh, work permits. But we recognize that we have a way to go in terms of achieving a level or a satisfactory level on an ongoing basis. Okay. What you currently have is peaks and valleys. And so some days we're, we're processing way, be, way, beyond, way within processing times, and then some weeks were below processing times. Okay. And the solution to that particular pro problem is creating the efficiency by automating and digitizing the system. Um, if you listen to the Premier and his remarks in the speech from the Dwern, it accepted that we need to do better in that area. And we will focus on a digitization process um, so that we become more efficient in our processing because we want to ensure that we have the labor that companies desire um, and to Bermuda in a timely manner so that they can maximize their level of effectiveness. Okay, thank you very much. And I, I perhaps on that note, maybe circle back a little bit to real estate. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously, we, we'd like to encourage more expatriates to come to the island to help us with those areas that we do need help in. Uh, if I could talk about recent updates provided by Coldwell Banker Realty indicated a continued decline in inventory for both sales and rentals. Mm -hmm. And this is of great concern. Time is of the essence, as we know, as we try to keep building Bermuda. And the vicious cycle seems to continue. We, we continue to struggle to retain both local and expatriate re residents and you mm -hmm. know retention is one of the key points here and we continue to suffer from a decreasing population so how is this really being addressed this housing crisis and and with what speed and perhaps to my panelists my other panelists mm -hmm. not just to minister haywood not to leave mm -hmm. you out it's really you know how does it affect your areas of work because as we've discussed throughout this evening we all do have to work together and make it work better so sure i <clears throat> Um, I think you are spot on from the perspective of the housing situation is absolutely a national priority. Mm -hmm. It is necessary to facilitate the economic growth that we all wish to seek. Uh, the BDC under the Uptown Development Authority, as I mentioned earlier, is really focused on what we're calling the approved residential schemes. We are actively engaged with um, investors we believe that we are on the fringe of getting some residential development, um, large-scale residential development uh, shovels on the ground. Um, and so we continue to focus, and our aim is to absolutely get us across the line so that we can be in a space where we can have um, development in these particular areas to then facilitate the growth that we wish to see. Okay. And for us at Workforce Development, it's important because housing insecurity for someone who's looking for a job is if you don't know how you're, where you're gonna rest okay. your head <laughs> at night, it's yes. hard for you to concentrate on saying that you want to get the tools that you need in order to be successful in your employment. So sometimes we spend time trying to assist persons with ensuring that they have housing. Okay. 
um, and connecting with our other helping services so that we can help support them in that area as well as helping them with uh, their career journey. So um, ensuring that persons have housing is really, is very much uh, important and it is a national concern um, for that. Okay, thank you. But it, it presents an opportunity, an uh, opportunity mm -hmm. to um, unlock greater levels of development. Um, developers are looking for a demand and now it is clear that demand is absolutely there. And so how we can better support investment to ensure uh, that we uh, encourage and facilitate the, the level of, of development that we would like to see. We have a city plan that is underutilized. The city plan is specifically um, states that the plan is designed to ensure that more people um, live, work, and play in the city. Yes. And that's what we want to see. There's huge upside um, from going upwards in, our, in the city of Hamilton. I think that pre presents uh, opportunity to ensure that we increase our housing inventory, but also what they would do is if we have more people living and re, um, working in the city, it cuts down on the congestion in the morning, but then it also frees up inventory throughout the island, which will bring down the um, rental prices throughout the entire right. island as well. Okay, thank you. Shimani, I was just going to say from the BBA <laughs> perspective, we touch it from two different sides, and, and one is the supply side, one is the demand yes. side. When we're trying to recruit that next company to come mm -hmm. launch something in Bermuda, it certainly is a question that's asked of where will I live, and so right. we have to be able to... Uh, as Bermuda, we have to be able to meet that demand if we're trying to say, bring your company here, and we know that's going to come with, you know, X number of your of your leadership team. Uh, but we also touch it on on the other side, which is we're often talking to potential investors who are saying, David, tell me something I can invest in in Bermuda. Okay. And we get to be the ones usually to say, well, let us tell you about redevelopment in Hamilton. There might be something there that would interest you. And we've had a couple clients oh, that have, have gone okay. that direction. Yeah. Right. Thank you for that perspective. Sure. So I have time for one last question before closing remarks. It's quite hot under these lights. I think everyone will agree. <laughs> um, so back to finance again. Um, so within the financial and local insurance services section, the government's initiative of a Bermuda National Digital Bank identifies four pathways to implementation. This business plan has not yet been made public. Is it possible to provide any kind of overview of this and what perhaps are the ultimate goals or services of the digital bank? And I think that's back to you, Minister Hayward. Yeah, so, so I think what we acknowledge is that uh, traditional banks are not serving all of our banking needs. And there are areas in uh, economic plans that require banking solutions. Yes. And so we'll work as best as we possibly can to try to identify um, alternative banking solutions. But we have to talk about expanding our current banking sector and reform of our current banking sector. And that's part of the economic development strategy. Um, understanding that there is huge opportunity from alternative financing. Um, there are opportunity from decentralized financing as well, and um, having greater levels of, of fintech um, solutions to some of the problems that we currently have. And so as best as we, we possibly can, we're looking at how we can diversify our banking sector so that we can provide the full range of services that businesses need so that they can be successful in Bermuda. Okay. Thank you very much. It's if been I, a I yes, would. please. So the National Digital Bank is an interesting space because quite um, as the minister articulated, we recognize that there were underserved industries and areas um, that were having challenges, particularly um, having banking issues, it's flat out. Um, but in terms of the National Digital Plan, so um, as you mentioned, we got to four um, identified areas but I wouldn't necessarily say the plan is actually complete. So we got to a particular stage where okay. those four were identified, and then the government is actually doing an analysis on those four to then further um, develop the, the, the choice that it decides. So sort of simplify it, we got to a space where four options were presented. 
and now the government is doing an, its analysis on those four options okay. to then do choose one of the four and then do right. further analysis the on that four right. best pathway. So once that is completed, then absolutely that plan will be made to the public. Okay. No, thank you very much. So it's been a very fruitful discussion this evening. Um, we've worked through the pretty much the whole Bermuda economic <laughs> development strategy. I hope all it's been pages. clear. All, all 63 pages. <laughs> I promise you all 63 pages. And um, I would perhaps ask each of these wonderful panellists, beginning with you, Jashe, since you're the most warmed up now, right. <laughs> to, to provide me with some final remarks, please. Yeah, so <clears throat> um, I just want to thank you, Shivani. Thank you, Minister. Um, for the opportunity to be here and speak on behalf of the BEDC. Um, I think it is a necessary piece. Obviously, uh, it's a key priority area, um, entrepreneurship. And so what we're focused on is continuing not just the plan, but the execution of that plan. And so we'll continue to do our piece. We'll continue to do our part. We, may, we remain available to collaborate with other industry stakeholders, as well as the entrepreneurs themselves, who are ultimately who we are here to serve. OK. Thank you. Malika. Thank you. It's been a great evening, and I don't often get to talk about workforce development in this much depth. But I just want to let people know that we are there. Our support services are there for you. And people. Most yes. important part, yes. even though we talk about technology and artificial intelligence, people are what are going to keep everything moving. So definitely come and see us at Workforce Development if you'd like to explore some different career options. <laughs> okay, thank yes. you very much. And David? Shivani, it's a pleasure to be with you <laughs> in this amazing panel. Um, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, I guess if I were to sum up, I would say I'm incredibly bullish on Bermuda's future. It's such a special place, and I'm thrilled to be a part of it. Um, I would say to the audience, uh, we need to all find ways to row together. We're in the same, we're yes. in the same family boat, yeah. and um, it's a competitive world out there in places where um, the community's not all rowing together. Um, they're not going to finish first, so we need to row together. And don't be afraid to dream big. Let's dream big, row together, uh, and let's win. Okay, thank you very much. And before I come back to Honourable Minister Hayward for his closing remarks, I would <coughs> once again like to thank the panellists, Shea Adams, you. Malika Cartwright, and David Hart for being here this evening. It's been an incredibly important discussion. Thank and thank you for having me, actually. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I would like to now hand over to Honourable Minister Hayward for his closing remarks. Uh, certainly, thank you, Shivani, and thank you to the panelists um, for the dialogue tonight. It was very enjoyable, but I think if there's one thing we want to leave the public with is that the government has a plan. The government has a vision. The government is as extremely bullish, like David said, and optimistic about the opportunities that will exist for Bermuda's future. Um, we will work diligently and deliberately to execute on the street five um, priority areas. The strategic initiatives all have action items. Those action items will, we will ensure that we focus our time and resources for the effective execution of those action items. I don't want anyone to, um, who is listening tonight to feel as though there is um, this plan, this absence of something for them. The entire plan is designed to improve the opportunities in Bermuda. It's designed to ensure that Bermudians have a better quality of life. It's designed to support our small businesses. It's designed to support our farmers and fishermen. It's designed to grow our industries. It's designed to develop um, and diversify our economy. And it's designed to ensure that we have a sustainable future that works for all of Bermuda and our residents. And so, again, everyone, thank you. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed the dialogue, and I hope that the listening audience enjoyed as well. Thank you very much. Okay, so I think that's, that's the end of our wonderful discussion here this evening. Honourable Minister Hayward has just mentioned.